when we come to the practice, we often want to go straight to the top. Four Noble Truths, three characteristics, emptiness. And yet it's like building a house without a foundation, or setting up a pole without having anything to support it. The foundation is important, the poles are important. Just because something is elementary doesn't mean that it's beneath us. It deals with elements, it deals with basic principles that have to be established before you can build on top of it. This is why, in most cases, when the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths, he didn't start out with the Four Noble Truths. He started out with what's called a graduated discourse. Building on really basic things like generosity, virtue, and even these build on a foundation, which is what's called mundane right view. The way it's expressed in the canon is rather strange. It starts out by saying, there is what is given, what is offered, what is sacrificed. There is mother and father. There are spontaneously born beings. There is a this world and another world. And there are those who know these things, for sure, from direct knowledge. It's not just a theory. And maybe it's because these Sentences sound so strange that people skip over this teaching. But then have we seen so often in the West that people try to skip over things like this, end up finding that they sometimes the practice actually aggravates whatever mental problems they have. A lot of people come to the practice, and Western culture is pretty neurotic to begin with. And sometimes straight old meditation practice or straight mindfulness practice can aggravate some of those problems. This is why some teachers say, well, you've got to do psychotherapeutic work along with the meditation to deal with the problems. But the Buddha's already given us a way of dealing with those problems, with mundane right view. This too is therapeutic. When the Buddha is talking about generosity, he's saying generosity is real. People give because they have the choice to give. That means it comes out of the goodness of their hearts, and that generosity bears fruit. In other words, the goodness of your heart does bear fruit. Perhaps one of the reasons we're so messed up in the West is because our culture is designed so that goodness of heart doesn't really count for much. The society is designed to take advantage of it. The good-hearted people are not the ones who rise to the top. And because we believe rising to the top is an important thing, goodness of heart doesn't even seem to count for much. And the Buddha wants to reestablish that. Even in India, of course, society was not necessarily designed that the good people would rise to the top. Remember, when the Buddha would talk about kings, he would often put them in the same phrase as kings and thieves. And so it wasn't the case that society was moral back then and somehow changed now. There are a lot of immoral elements in society all over the world. But the Buddha is asking you to look at the good results that come from generosity, not only the impact on the person who receives the gift, but also the good things that happen in your own heart when you're generous. He's saying, value that. Value the freedom of choice that you have. Value the good results that come from generosity. These are important. In fact, you often hear the Thai John say that the whole practice is one thing clear through. 
You start with generosity and you end with letting go. And there's a lot of letting go that comes, but it's letting go that happens in conjunction with developing good qualities of mind and then appreciating those good qualities of mind. And so learning to appreciate these things is a part of the therapy of mundane right view. There is mother and father. This is another big issue. A lot of us have very conflicted relations with our parents. And it's not that this was not the case in the Buddhist time. Everybody has a conflicted relation with their parents. We're all disappointed in our parents in one way or another. Because after all, parents are human beings. They have their imperfections. And as I say, it's a wise parent who knows his child, but children know their parents pretty thoroughly. Much more parent much more thoroughly than the parents would like. But when the Buddha brings up the issue of mother and father, he's bringing up the issue of gratitude. Gratitude, again, is one of those good-hearted qualities that's nourishing for the person who can develop it. Sometimes we feel that if we're grateful to our parents, maybe they don't deserve it. We're giving them something they don't deserve. Well, that's not the case at all. As we develop gratitude, we develop a sense of appreciation. If nothing else, they gave us this body. Our mother went through pregnancy with all the difficulties of that. There's that chant that they give in Thailand before a young man will ordain as a monk. Nowadays it's given less and less, but in the old days it was a standard part of the ordination ceremony. That Before you actually had the ordination, you'd sit and listen to a chant that would go on for about two or three hours about all the trouble your parents went through to raise you. Perhaps 90% of the chant is about your mother's pregnancy, all the illnesses and other problems she had carrying this load around in her body. And if you can't be grateful for that, what are you going to be grateful for? So you have to look at your parents and all their imperfections and realize that you have a huge debt to them. And again, in developing an attitude of gratitude, it's not a question of whether they deserve it or not. You benefit from it. It's therapeutic to the mind to realize that regardless of their failings, regardless of whatever abuse you may have suffered, whatever disappointments you may have experienced, still gratitude is healthy for the mind because it helps you to appreciate all the good things, all the efforts that people went through to, to help you, and how you are dependent on their help. This again is one of the problems in modern society, is that people make huge fortunes and they say, well, I did this all on my own. I don't owe anything to anybody. Well, you look around and you realize that nobody does anything on their own. We're all dependent on our parents, our teachers. all the various things that society provides, that the government has provided, that generous people have provided in one way or another. And it's good to keep that in mind. Because you, re you realize the goodness that, that you are dependent on, it makes you much more inclined to do good yourself. A while back I was reading an article in a magazine about gratitude, and the author was focusing on the gout weed in her garden, which apparently is a really tenacious weed that's very hard to eradicate. And she was learning how to develop gratitude to the gout weed because it taught her good lessons about persistence and acceptance. That's missing the point. The gout weed has no intention to do anything good for you. You may appreciate the lessons you learn from the Gautweed, but gratitude is for actions that people have done, actions that living beings have done. 
Pali, the word is katanyu or gatawedi, which both have the meaning of a sense of gratitude of what you owe to other people for the actions they've done and the desire to do something either in return directly to them or just give it back to the world at large. Because the focus here is on action. Because that's something really special, the things that people do, they go out of their way to do something. And having appreciation for that, having gratitude for that, makes it easier for you to go out of your way. The gout weed doesn't have any intention at all, it just grows. And you may appreciate the lessons you learn from it, but the gratitude should be reserved for the actions of living beings. Because your relationship with God weed is not nearly as conflicted as, say, your relationship with your parents or other people to whom you have debts. And it's important to sort those issues out before you can really make any progress in the practice. Not necessarily going back and hashing things out with the people, but hashing out your attitude. Because you will find as you practice that you have developed some pretty unskillful attitudes from your parents. The Buddha had to teach people to drop a lot of the attitudes they had learned from their parents in his time. And you can let go of those attitudes with a sense of ease, with a sense of peace, only if you're at peace with the people that you learn them from, realizing that they were well-meaning. And so you're not just throwing it away or throwing those attitudes away out of anger or aversion. But you're trying to sift through the relationship and say, okay, what's worthy of keeping and what's worthy of throwing away? And if it can be done in an attitude of gratitude, it's a lot easier to do this skillfully. As for this world and the next, and the spontaneously born beings, it's basically the principle of karma and rebirth. This, too, is a therapeutic attitude, therapeutic teaching. Because whatever difficulties come up, you can say, well, I must have done something in the past. And it's not to blame yourself for it, but just to have a better attitude of equanimity for the hardships that come up. But then also realize, here you are, a human being. It the fact that you are a human being dependent on your good actions in the past. So you don't want to just use up all the good that's come from the effort you've put in in the past. It's like taking your profits and reinvesting them. Rather than just eating them up. And realizing that the life goes on, even after death. We sometimes think of this as a teaching of self in capital letters, but it's in the Buddhist teachings it's actually associated with the teaching on non-self. There's so much in this lifetime you're going to have to let go, abandon, leave behind. And the question is, what can you take with you? And all those people and all the corporations that have who stepped on other people in order to get ahead, that position they gained, they're not going to be able to take with them. All they're taking is the karma from stepping on people's heads, which is not a good thing to take with you. So again, it helps give you a, an attitude of equanimity, sort of disenchantment with all the values of the world. And it's also therapy for the mind. So the times, sometimes as you stick to what's right, there may be disadvantages now, but they're not going to be disadvantages always. The Buddha said the sign of wisdom is when you look for long-term happiness, and sometimes long-term happiness requires letting go of short-term happiness. So the teachings on karma and rebirth help give you a long view. 
the Buddha never tried to prove that these things were true, but he said it's a really good working hypothesis, and it is therapeutic. If you learn how to use his teachings well, it's therapeutic. There are a lot of unskillful ways of using the teaching, but the Buddha never encouraged those. They're blaming the victim kind of things. Or saying, well, people are suffering right now, the fact that they're suffering means they deserved it. That's not the case. The Buddha never talks about anybody deserving anything. It's just there's action and then there's results. The actual happiness or pain that we feel right now, pleasure or pain, happiness or suffering, depends to a large extent on our present karma, how we deal with the raw materials from the past. And when you think in those terms, it gives a real focus to the meditation, that we're here to learn about present karma. To see, well, what are we doing right now that's contributing unnecessary suffering, unnecessary, unnecessary stress? That too is a therapeutic teaching. It means that regardless of the situation outside, you can always look inside and make sure that at the very least you're not adding anything extra. And it turns out that it's the extra stuff that we add. That's what really weighs the mind down. The mind does not have to be weighed down, no matter how bad things get outside. So all these teachings, even though they may sound strange in the Pali, or the way they're phrased in the canon, they really are therapy. that gets the mind in the right position so it can handle the Four Noble Truths and handle all the other more advanced teachings. So don't overlook the foundation. The foundation is important. Without it, you can't build the house. If you try building the house without the foundation, then when an earthquake comes, it'll just slide down the hill. And remember, there's really nothing missing in the Buddha's teachings, just that we tend to overlook certain teachings, because we don't realize how useful and valuable they are. But when you take the path as a whole, you find that everything's there. It's just a matter of putting it to the proper use.